Hey everyone, my name is Michael Reese. I'm the lead pastor here at Sharon Missionary Baptist Church. I'm so excited that you get a chance to view uh, our services via YouTube or whatever channel or format you're watching this on. I want to encourage you today uh, to make it a matter of prayer to dive deep into God's Word. It is definitely a privilege to be able to have God's Word, to preach God's Word, and to dig in and study God's Word. Also, I want to encourage you, if you don't currently belong to a local church somewhere that preaches God's Word, His truth, I want to encourage you today, join a local church, get involved in a local assembly, a local body of believers that will encourage you and help your growth. Uh, so whether it's Sharon Missionary Baptist Church or some other church that's preaching uh, God's uh, timeless truth, I pray that you would do that today. And so enjoy this resource. Again, good to see everyone here, and thank you, Parker, for leading us in that word of prayer for, you know, there's several individuals and church members that have had a lot of health difficulties in our church, and we need to be lifting them up in prayer. And go ahead and open your Bibles, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to continue our study in that book, God is Faithful. And thank the Lord that God is faithful in every circumstance of life. And we need to remember that even in the difficult times, even in the difficult days, God is faithful. Look at, let's begin with verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who has knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish. For whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you're, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food make my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we thank you and give you all the praise for everything. May your spirit go before your word this morning. Help us to trust you in all things. In Christ's name, amen. And looking at this on subject of being a stumbling block, and uh, there's what it is in this section of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and Romans chapter 14 are two, of course, two letters that Paul wrote. In this section of scripture, there was an issue that had come up that a lot of church members were dealing with, and that is um, basically, let's put it this way. Uh, there's a, a church down the road, and they teach pagan uh, style of beliefs and practices, and one of the main church members of pagan church down the road owns the local Kroger, okay? Well, they get all of their meat at the local Kroger there in Paul's day from that church member who goes, and matter of fact, he offers all those cows and chickens or whatever at the altar to that false church. And so Paul's saying it's okay to eat these animals. There's no law preventing eating these animals, uh, but you're going there, you're buying these, this meat at this store owned by Mr. Pagan Churchgoer, church member at that church down the road that teaches all kinds of things against God's word. And so this was causing some church members to stumble saying, you shouldn't eat that meat sacrificed to those idols. Or don't even go in that store and purchase that meat. And so this, he uses this same illustration in this chapter and in Romans chapter 14. They're, all, they're very, very similar and use some great verses. We're going to look at some of them. 
But basically what this is is that a lot of times, you know, we'll say, there's nothing wrong with me doing this. There's nothing wrong with me doing this. But what if what you do causes uh, your brother to stumble? Usually in this, I also need to make this uh, reference. Usually the person that's offended is usually a young Christian or an immature Christian. You know, they really haven't grown in the Lord, but usually the offended person is either young or they're immature and they just haven't, and a lot of times they don't follow scriptural practices. They're the most easily offended in this section of scripture. And even today, people that get offended over um, what some, and listen to this, people get offended over what people wear People will get offended. I've seen people get offended over tattoos. People get offended over piercings. People get offended, and it's usually over preferential things. And generally, the offended person is either young in their faith or immature in their faith. And they don't even have the, the maturity to say, you know what, I, if I'm offended, I need to find out why. Do I have a scripture to stand on? Do I even have the biblical uh, wherewithal to say, you know what, I need to go visit with that person and talk with them. Maybe their actions, and usually this, this is what happens. And this happens a lot of times, and I'll just use Brother Michael as an illustration at this point, is a lot of times Brother Michael will offend somebody by his actions, what he says or does. And, did you, and guess what Brother Michael doesn't know? <laughs> doesn't even know that he offended said person. So they'll walk around in their feelings and in their sorrow and they're in their heartache and then they're stumbled. And, and a lot of times it's because and they won't even pursue anything scriptural or biblical. So let's check this out. And a lot of times we can do things to prevent this. And why I even put this in God's word? Well, I think God knew that we needed this in his word, that we needed to tackle this. All right, so let's head to 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 1, there's 10 verses that we're going to tackle over here in this introduction. So Peter had been offended, and he had offended people, okay? Peter definitely was one to be bold and sometimes offensive in his actions. And the meaning of stumbling block. The, the, did you know, let me go ahead and say this, Jesus was a stumbling block. Hello. Now, if you're living for Christ, if I want to get to First Peter chapter two, if you're living for Jesus, you're. I don't want people stumbling over me. I want people stumbling over Jesus because a lot of times, if I'm being the stumbling block, it's a, it's a fleshly thing. But if Jesus is being the stumbling block, it's a spiritual thing, okay? And by Jesus being the stumbling block, meaning it means this. Well, I just think that's narrow-minded to say Jesus is the only way. That just sounds a little narrow-minded, preacher. You're just being a little, there's a lot of ways in the heaven. Oh, yeah. But Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth. and the, You see how that can be a stumbling block to some people? Some people say, you know what, I just think... Brother Michael, you just got to love everybody. Just love everybody. And if you're more good than bad, you're going to make it to heaven. By George, I like my, my gospel. And if it ain't in the Bible, I know it's in the Bible. Brother Michael, where does it say be good and you'll make it to heaven? And I'll say, it's not in there. <laughs> it's not in there. And so G, uh, the apostle Peter was writing to these persecuted Christians and he says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, and envying evil speaking. In other words, stop talking about other people. Get out of yourself. Get your eyes focused on Jesus. A lot of times we're distracted by or, you know, and we'll, we will run down somebody and talk about somebody. We'll murder them on social media. And even Jesus said this, is that Jesus said, you know, you say, you who say you've never committed murder, but a lot of times we'll murder people with our actions, with our lips, 
with the way we speak about them or talk to them. That's all, verse 1 is about immaturity as newborn babes desiring to, and by the way, all of us should seek to grow. Amen? If you're saved this morning, can, if you're saved this morning and you want to grow closer to the Lord, can I get you to say amen? amen. You just signed on the dotted line. <laughs> you just said you wanted to grow. And I hope and pray that you do. You want to grow, so I want to grow. And the other day, Karen walked in the house, like yesterday, and she said, well, Kroger had the, by the way, Kroger doesn't have pagan meat that I know of, so anyway, so and I was speaking about Paul's day, okay? And uh, she walked in the house, and she said, Michael, I got you 2% milk. We've been married 35 years, and I've just now discovered you do not like half percent or one percent milk which I you know I like at least minimum that two percent milk it's got some substance to it it's just not colored water okay and uh so I like milk I want to grow I want it on my cereal okay so I, it's here the same way that's verse two verse three if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you're breathing right now, the Lord is good. Amen. <laughs> if you're breathing, the Lord is good. Verse 4, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men. If you live for Christ, you will have fingers pointed at you. But chosen by God and precious. He loves you. Amen. Okay, moving on, verse 5. And also as living stones being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. When it says a holy priesthood, it means this. Jesus is the high priest. Did y'all know in the Bible days, in the Old Testament, they had a high priest? He was like the fellow who went to the Lord, into the presence of the Holy of Holies. But then they also had a bunch of the tribe of Levi who were priests, they screwed in the curtain sockets, they mounted the posts, they put up the tabernacle, they cleaned this, they cleaned, and everybody's bringing these animals to be sacrificed. Somebody is taking the animals and cleaning them and putting them on the brazen altar, preparing all the stuff. Basically, all the priests did was all the work behind the scenes. Guess who? Guess what? We're a holy priesthood. Guess who our high priest is? Jesus Christ. Guess who does the work behind the scenes? We do. We're a holy priesthood doing the work of our high priest every day behind the scenes. All right. So this holy priesthood, and that's what that's talking about. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture, this Old Testament quote. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. This is talking about Christ. Elect precious and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected becomes the chief cor cornerstone. That's Christ. And guess what he becomes? A stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. In verse 8, this stone, they stumble being disobedient to the word. I stumble over Jesus because surely there's another way into heaven. I stumble over Jesus because I don't want to be holy. I stumble over Jesus. I don't have to go to church. Jesus calls all men to follow him. And if you truly follow him, you'll want to love others. You'll want to come to church. You'll want to join up with a local ecclesia church, okay? You'll want to go to work. You'll want to roll up your sleeves. But if you feel led to just stay in the background and just hover and bicker and gossip, you become a stone of stumbling. You become a stumbling stone, not Jesus. People stumble over us in our actions, in our behavior, in our attitude, in our preferences. And that, so if they're going to stumble to get to heaven, 
Let them stumble over Christ, not us. Go back to our text. Now, it says here in the verses 1 through 3, now I did, which I did not read yet, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that all have, we all have knowledge, basically knowledge of facts and knowledge of Christ and knowledge of Jesus. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing as yet he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. And simply put in here that knowledge is basically um, surface level, it's physical, it's, uh, as I put in your outline, it's superficial. Uh, knowledge sometimes is it can cause you to think holier than thou thoughts of other people. But think about this. Usually knowledge, knowledge says this. I know a lot about the Bible. Knowledge says this. I've been coming to church a long time. Knowledge says this. I have been saved and alive longer than you. It makes me superior to you. Now, you may not have ever said that, but sometimes our actions, our knowledge puts that out there. Love is superior. Why? Love says, I'm no better than you. I love you and I care for you. Love edifies, builds up. That's what the scripture just said. Love says, I want to look out for you. How can I help you? Love says, this church and life is not about me. This church is about the, the gospel getting to the lost. You see what I mean? That's love. You love people. You love the lost, and that's what Scripture says. And matter of fact, you say, no, nah, it really doesn't say that. Glad you asked. <laughs> First, just a couple pages over, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's in there in your Scripture, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, when I was a child... When I was immature in my faith, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, that word just simply means I'm a grown, an adult, I'm supposed to be mature, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. For I know I have knowledge in part, but, when I shall, but then I shall know just as I am known. And now, in other words, when I'm grown up, Sometimes when I'm young, I don't understand. Verse 13, and now abides faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Skip down now, back in our text. I want to go to uh, point number two, which is the measure of idols. And uh, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 4, the word of God says this, Therefore concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. So there's only one God, but people make these little statues and call them gods, verse 5. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or earth, and there are many gods and many lords, meaning statues and stones and things that people call gods, verse 6, yet for us in this room, there is only one God. One and the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. There's a, a, a bunch of verses, and I do want to grab this one in the Old Testament that kind of poke fun about idols. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and I want to grab this uh, verse of Scripture and verse 35. Deuteronomy chapter 4, we'll look at 35 and 39. To you, it, it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself, he's God. This is the writing to the younger generation that's going into the promised land. And by the way, the Lord himself is God. There is none other beside God. Him. Verse 39, therefore know this day and consider it in your heart that the Lord himself is God in heaven and above earth and on the earth beneath and there is no other. 
the measure of idols is that, <clears throat> and there's a bunch of verses that talk about idols. Uh, and I've shared this story before is that we had a Chinese foreign exchange student that lived with us, and his name was Robbing, and uh, is short for Chunting Giao, which uh, is his full name. And we really enjoyed Finally, Robbing got saved, but before he got saved, he would always say this on Sunday. He would say, are we going to the temple today? <laughs> and I knew from having research where he was from and different things is that th they had a lot of different what they called temples and gods and different things at these different temples. And he just thought we were worshiping another God at another temple, okay? And finally one day I walked outside and I remember how Paul dealt with uh, or stated these things to the people in Athens. And he was talking to these people who had all these idols everywhere on Mars Hill on this place, the area Opagus. And he said this, uh, and basically when I walked outside in Ashley County, Arkansas, and I'm still at my wit's end because I don't know how to witness to this fellow from China, not only is our English, we're having trouble with English, but we're having trouble with culture. And I looked down and I took my boot and I scuffed the dirt and I said, Robbing, the God I worship created that dirt. And there's only one God who's ever made dirt. And it's God Jehovah. I looked over there at that pine tree and I said, Robbing, our God, the one I worship, made that pine tree. And there's only one God that's made a pine tree. And by the way, this God who I worship, who made the dirt in the pine tree, in the sky, and that bird flying right there, he has a son and his name is Jesus. And Robbing said, I think I've heard of him. And later on, finally, he came to know Jesus as his Savior. And matter of fact, whenever he prayed, I'll never forget this. This is really cool. And he's just sobbing under conviction. He said, he didn't know how to say I've sinned. You know what he said? Because he remembers English is limited. He said, I am wrong. That was his, his English way of saying I have sinned. And then right before he prayed to, for Jesus to come into his life, he looked at me and he says, does God understand Chinese? <laughs> and I said, he sure does. Amen. You can pray in any language you want to, and he'll hear you. But you can stumble over knowledge. You can stumble over being puffed up. But whether you're in Mexico or U.S. or China, pray in any language, and that same God will hear you and save you Amen. and change your life. And, uh, and so I hope and pray that there's no other God. Amen. There's no other, no other God. There's no other God that made dirt or pine trees. Okay. Moving on for lack of time, let's, let's hit it. Uh, point number three. I want to grab this. And back in our text, let's grab a hold of it. In verse seven. However, there is not in every one talking about belief in idols and stuff offered to idols and young Christians, there is not in everyone that knowledge for some with conscience of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol. And their conscience, notice here, being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God for neither if we eat are we the better or if we eat are the worse. And so stumbling over something that doesn't matter, um, and it could be clothing, it could be music, it could be piercings, it could be tattoos, it could be whether somebody um, uh, drinks uh, alcoholic beverage, it could be uh, if somebody lets a cuss word fly every now and then. All of these things that people say well, because I saw you do this, I, f I stumble over your actions. I stumble over how you behave. I stumble over, and by that, usually we're the weaker Christian if we're the ones stumbling over that because we won't pursue things in a biblical, godly way, okay? We let those things hinder us in our walk. 
I do want you to back up. I said we were headed to Romans. Now we're going to head to Romans. Because the way he phrases things in Romans does give a little bit more insight into these actions. Okay? Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Romans 14, 1 through 3 says this. Receive one who is weak in faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things, in other words, trivial things. But to the weak, it's not a trivial thing. I have to remember that. Because, and I, I, I need to know this, is that if uh, at the same time we're pursuing Jesus with all of our might and it offends somebody, that's not saying we should stop pursuing Jesus. Because remember, even Jesus made people stumble, but he was pursuing righteousness. Verse 2, for one who believes... In you know, the words, you're saved, may eat all things. You can go to Kroger and buy anything and eat it. But he who is weak only eats vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. In other words, uh, well, let's say this. Um... There's a church down the road. And by the way, man, Saline County has so many churches that if you shake a tree, there's going to be a Baptist preacher fall out of it. There's churches everywhere, okay? There's preachers and churches everywhere. And so, but, but a lot of us, according to verses 1 through 3, that, especially that one right there on the screen. I become a stumbling block whenever... That church down the road who preaches the same gospel I do, and I criticize the people there because I don't like their, the way they do church, the timing of their church, the dress code in their church, the songs in their church, the music in their church, the way the pastor behaves, the way the youth group does. But you see what I mean? And so you're, you're criticizing over preferences, and we actually do this. We despise the one, even though they have the same God we do, the same Jesus, the same everything, and then we become the stumbling block. We're stumbling over them, then we become the stumbling block. Now, still in Romans 14, check it out, verse 7. Romans 14, verse 7. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose again and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? And we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, okay? For it is written... As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Man, that verse 13, that'll preach. <laughs> so in other words, to get caught up on preferences, to get caught up on your own personal agenda, and to, and to basically to become a stumbling block because we put others down so much because of their actions or inactions. And so we've become a stumbling block. And verse 15 says this, Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Now that means this. That if I know that uh, eating, I'm just going to make something up. Eating sardines offends, uh, I'm pick on Hayden down here at the front. If I know eating sardines offends Hayden, I'm just going to go over there. You just need to get more mature, Hayden. I'm just going to eat these sardines right in front of you, okay? You just need to grow up. That verse says this, that I need to say, I, Hayden, I did not realize that eating these sardines right in front of you offended you. Even though it's technically okay for me to eat these sardines, I don't, I'm not going to eat them. And it's okay. But 
I don't want to, I want, I want him to get stronger. I want him to grow. I want him to mature. And so I don't, I'm not going to do that, okay, in this instance. And then finally, verse 19 through 21, still in Romans 14, verse 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify or build up one another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. In other words, I'm coming to church and I'm going to get my way. I'm going to do everything I want to do. I'm going to make sure I don't care who it offends. I'm going to get my way. And that's destroying the work of God for the sake of a preference. And food, it says food here for sake of a preference. And then, of course, in this verse 20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Verse 21, it is good neither to eat meat, nor to drink wine, nor to do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. And remember, the one offended is usually the what? The younger Christian or the more immature Christian. I need to be aware of that there are younger or immature Christians whom I, my actions, they may not understand. Okay, so back in our text, we're going to wrap it up and finish it up this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I've already read verses 9 through 13, but check out especially the last two verses. So Romans chapter 8 and verse 12. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if, and the same thing that I just read over in Romans, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Now think about this. Let's try to make this at home. Even though whether it's sardines or whether it's something else, why would a Christian put their feelings and their preferences aside in order to encourage another brother or sister? Let me repeat that again very slowly. Why would a Christian church member put their feelings or preferences aside in order not to offend or discourage another brother or sister because they love them. Love edifies. Knowledge means I know the Bible. I know what I can do. And I've, and I've got a list. I've got a pedigree. <laughs> A pedigree means I'm a fourth generation missionary Baptist. I've been saved 400,000 years. I've been, I got, I know the Bible backwards and forwards and you don't know the Bible from a hole in your head. You know, knowledge, and I know that's a lot of exaggeration, but knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You see the difference? That's one of the biggest takeaways. If you could take that away from this message this morning, is I need to love my brother or sister first. And if I do something to offend them because of my actions or inactions, that I seek reconciliation and I seek to make things right. And, by the way, when you came to church this morning, was it, I, I'm coming to church this morning to build others up, to encourage other people, or did I come to discourage other people, to bring them down. What are, where are my eyes? Where is my heart? And what comes out of my mouth, my actions affects other people. Does that make sense? Yeah. So let's give our heart to Christ this morning. Let's say, hey, if I've done something to offend or cause somebody to stumble, how can I make that right? How can I do better? There's, and as I've shown y'all, I covered a lot of scripture and even skipped some, didn't I? Because it's there. And that's one good thing about putting it in the bulletin. You can follow up and check it out, okay? You can see that it's there. May we be a church that reflects Jesus, amen? 
And maybe we will be a church that acts more like him because we spend time with him. Let's pray. Father, all of our actions or decisions, the way we, um, even the way we deal with each other is a reflection of our heart. It's a reflection of what's going on inside of us and how we're walking with you or how we're not walking with you. And Father, as we've journeyed through this book, we have tackled some tough things, but help us not to shy away from the tough things. Help us to be more like you. Help us in our actions to love other people, love each other enough not only to seek you, but to seek people. And may we, of course, with the gospel, seek the lost. May we be a church that's head over heels in love with you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. As we all stand to